Thanks, everybody. So uh, when I got asked by De Dr. Bodowitz to do this, I started doing a little, I said, okay, I'll do it without thinking. So then I started uh, doing a little bit of research on who has done this lecture before. And there is really a distinguished uh, cadre of astrophysicists and Nobel Prize winners and all this other stuff. So as you guys would have done, I called the professor and tried to get out of the assignment. <laughs> I said, hey, I don't work for NASA anymore. He goes, oh, we don't worry about that. I said, okay, I've got, I've got the magic ticket to get out of doing this work. I said, I work for the University of Alabama. And he went, oh, that's still okay. So now I'm here. <laughs> Hopefully you guys are going to get a, a, a good presentation. I'm not going to talk about cosmology or the, the origins of the universe or, you know, particle physics or any of that stuff. But for 35 years, I worked for NASA. And we're going to talk about the last thing that I got to work on before I retired is how we are architects in the future of exploration going from the moon to Mars and what that means for us as a nation uh, and, and the planet and how we're going to work together across the world to make this happen. So, You guys, uh, this was two Novembers ago, the most spectacular thing you could prob probably ever see, a night launch of our new moon rocket. Uh, it's taller than the Statue of Liberty uh, and it's, it's just incredible. And so this was the culmination of a lot of work. So we're going to talk about, I'm going to talk about what the Artemis program was. So before most of the people in this room were born, the United States went to the moon when I was four years old, and that was the Apollo program. So now our follow-on to that and our new, more sustainable, let's go to the moon and stay there and then figure out how to go to Mars program is called Artemis. So it's not just the United States. It's going to be a global community, and I'll talk about that. We want to put the first woman and the first person of color, which I've, uh, on the lunar surface. So this is a, this is a really remarkable achievement for our, ourselves as a nation. Uh, we have the Space Launch System rocket, which you see there, the Orion Crew spacecraft, which is on top of there. And I'll talk about these different programs and, and how we're going to get there. So when, that, when we named this thing Artemis, I didn't know what Artemis was. I didn't know who Artemis was. So I, did, I went back to my mythology. And Artemis is the twin sister of Apollo. And so that, that, was, that was the thought process behind this. So it's two sides of the coin. She's also, if you're a Roman mythologist instead of a Greek mythologist, she's also Diana in Roman mythology. She's the goddess of hunt and nature. And she's associated with Selene, which is the personification of the moon. So that all fits together, and that's why we named this program Artemis. So I talked about what we've done in the last 10 years. So if you've ever worked with NASA or understand how this works, it's design, test, fly, and fix. So over 10 years, we started working from doing a little bit of stuff on our launch abort system, to more testing, to putting our engine systems together and testing that, building this new uh, launch pad, rolling it out, and then finally, November 11, 2022, we launched Artemis and uh, uh, we launched Orion on an uncrewed mission that orbited the moon was it, as a test flight. And I don't know if you guys kept up with it, but it exceeded all expectations. Uh, the, the mission manager said it was eye-wateringly successful. So this is, is an incredible achievement by hundreds of thousands of people across the world. So uh, Dr. Bodowitz asked me to talk about architecture. So this is kind of, if we go to Mars, what it's going to look like. So I'll see if this laser pointer works here. So this is kind of a notion one, which they're calling a lot of exploration footprint. So it's, it's probably one of the first things we do. So we pre-deploy cargo. So this is what the astronauts are going to eat, the air they're going to breathe, uh, all, all the supplies and other things that they need. We're gonna, once we get the astronauts to Mars, we can't leave them there. So we have to build and deploy what we call the Mars Ascent Vehicle. So they land on Mars, work there for weeks, months, whatever the time is, and then this is how they get back home. Got to have some way for them to move around. So there's going to be a, a, some kind of rover, uh, most likely a pressurized rover. So initially they can live in the rover and then, and then move around, and then a habitat. So this is kind of our notional <coughs> architecture for the, the Mars surface. But what we're going to do first, and we can't go here until we go here, right? So we have to go to the moon first, learn how to work long durations in space, learn how to generate power, learn how to uh, build uh, an infrastructure that we can then transfer to Mars. So everything we're going to do on the moon, and these, most of these things, these programs, these projects, have already started working. A few weeks ago, we just let out some NASA let, uh, contracts for lunar terrain vehicle. Uh, one of those is with General Motors and another company. And then the Japanese space agency has also agreed to uh, have a, uh, to build a lunar terrain vehicle, a rover for us, for NASA. So you may have a Lexus and a Hummer on the moon. So that's, that's something for you guys to look out for. And I'll talk about each one of these uh, elements as we go through. But what I'm going to do is I'm going to talk about the missions first and then the, and then the things that, that fit into this architecture. 
So why the moon? You guys are interested in engineering and science. Obviously, there's a lot of value there. We don't want to spend a lot of money without getting something out of it. So first thing is, as we did in the Apollo program and all the other things, it advances science and technology. It gives folks in this room things to work on, things to do, things to advance where we are. It establishes, this is not purely an American thing, but it's going to establish, reestablish our leadership in space. Uh, we're going to prove, like I've been talking about, the technologies and abilities to sending people to Mars. Obviously, it's going to create opportunity for economic growth. You know, if, if some of you are from Huntsville, I talked to a bunch of folks that were graduating in aerospace, and three out of four of them were going to Huntsville, and the other one was going to Houston. They're all working on space and NASA-related things. So this is, this is kind of the, the, the opportunity for y'all to, to go grow and work. And obviously, after you come through, there's another generation. So we want to build that STEM capability. Uh, inspiring anybody to be an engineer and working in physics and STEM is a, is a net benefit to the world. So I'll talk about the different, con the, the different uh, components of our moon to Mars architecture. This is the Orion capsule. That's the moon. We're on the far side of the moon. And this was taken by a camera way out, uh, probably on this solar array. There's another solar array on the other side. This is just an incredible picture that shows the moon. There's another picture that shows the moon and the Earth far off, but uh, for some reason I didn't put that one in this presentation. Okay, so this is a physics lecture, so I want to talk a little bit about science. So these are some of the things that we want to do in the, uh, in the science world. First, we want to understand planetary processes, how planets work, how planets were formed. Uh, understand, we talk about lunar polar volatiles. We're going to go to the south pole of the moon. Uh, what's the history of the Earth-Moon system? What reveal the record of the ancient sun and, uh, and astronomy. Use, uh, use the moon as a place to build observatories. We have observatories in space, Chandra, AXAF, uh, Hubble Space Telescope, James Webb, but we can put a permanent observatories on the moon and that would be just uh, remarkable for some of the research that's going on here and other universities. And then obviously experimental science in the lunar environment. Somebody, uh, some of the folks I talked to today were talking about that. And then finally, Invest, this, is, this is the part that gets us ready for Mars. So figure out what we don't know and, and how to fix the problems that we'll run into. SLS, this is our launch, this is our rocket. I talked about this. It's about the size of the Statue of Liberty. Uh, it is the most powerful rocket that NASA has ever built. Oops. Going back, these are kind of the, for some reason, this does not want to stay. I apologize, y'all. All right, so it doesn't want to talk about uh, SLS. It's a really big rocket, everybody. It goes up. <laughs> Makes a lot of noise, and it's very, very impressive. This is our Orion crew, uh, crew uh, system. It consists of these kind of major parts. There's the crew module that's built in the United States. This is the service module. It's the European service module. So the European Space Agency is actually providing this to NASA, it gets, it gets put together at the, uh, at the Kennedy Space Flight Center, and this is the launch abort system. So as you guys know, we had a couple of very tragic accidents on the space shuttle system over the history of the program. And one of the things that happened was we, we did not have any way of aborting launch. If something bad happened, we just had to live through it. So this launch abort system, if we have an incident either uh, on the pad before, uh, before we launch the rocket or, or on the way up, we can, this, this system will serve to rescue the astronauts. So this was actually managed and developed by my old team at, uh, at the Marshall Space Flight Center in Huntsville. Exploration ground systems, I don't know, how many people have been to Kennedy Space Center and taken the tour? So you guys have been in the VAB, you know how big this building is. So this is where we put the rocket together and then we stack the Orion on top of it. To do that, we had to build a new mobile launcher. Uh, we're using the same crawler to, to put the rocket on. So this is a mobile launch pad. It goes out to Launch Complex 39 and then uh, we use that as a launch pad. Just an idea of how powerful the rocket was. It had generated so much acoustic noise that we actually damaged the pad, so we had to go back and rebuild it. So it was even more powerful than we thought and that we could model. So this is basically what our exploration ground systems does. They, they stack this vehicle. They, uh, they put it on the crawler way. It takes about nine hours to go about two miles. It goes at a very slow pace, at a walking pace. You can see folks walking around it. And then put it at the launch pad, and then they do launch operations. So these are kind of what we're doing right now in the near future. Artemis 1, we finished that. Artemis 2, we've already, we've already selected the crew. That's scheduled to go in 2025 if all things work well. Artemis 3, we'll go back to the moon. And then, and then we keep building on from there. So I'll talk about all these different things, and we'll talk about these, 
different uh, uh, sets of hardware and, and capabilities we build as we walk through the system. So Artemis 1, we've talked about this a lot. Mission was completed. It was eye-wateringly successful, as, as people have said. These are the new elements. All these were the first time, and they all worked. The, the, the rocket, the, the spacecraft, and we, you know, we had a new launch system. We had to have new software. We had to redo the whole launch process to use this rocket. So that's all been proven and tested. So we did the test. We did the fly. If there's any things that we have uh, problems with, we're in the fixed mode right now. Artemis 2, this is going to be our first crewed mission. So we're not going to land on the moon for Artemis 2, but we are going to orbit the moon with a full crew. Uh, that means we're going to add the life support systems to our Orion capsule. Uh, we're also going to have the emergency egress system for crew on the launch pad. So if something happens before we launch, we have, they have those, those slide wire baskets. I don't know if you guys have ever seen those. That's basically what it is. It's a long wire that reaches from the launch pad to the top of the launch pad to the ground. And you get in a metal basket, slide down. Uh, and then we're going to do more, more science and demonstrate some more technology. So this is our crew. This is a well-seasoned, incredibly uh, talented and accomplished bunch of people. Uh, I think we were talking about this uh, today where somebody said, well, it's the top 1%. It's probably the top 0.001% of the folks that, that, uh, in the world to, to become NASA astronauts. It's usually they, they have 10,000 applicants. They select 100 to take interviews. And there's usually about 20 selected, and half of those come out. So I didn't just do the math there, but one of you smart folks can do that. But these are the best of the best. This is our, this is our Artemis II crew. We have three Americans and a Canadian Space Agency astronaut. So again, this kind of goes to the global nature of what we're going to do uh, in the Artemis program. So Artemis III, we haven't selected a crew for that yet, but we have agreed that one of the, one of the, one of the Artemis uh, crew members is going to be a Japanese astronaut. So that's, that's pretty exciting in itself. That's part of the, the deal for them sending us the Lexus to put on the moon. Uh, so this is, we're going to be the first human landing on the South Pole region. We're going to uh, put four astronauts in lunar orbit and two on the surface. We're going to, obviously, we've got the full Orion. We're going to rendezvous in space. We're going to have a human landing system. We're going to have new spacesuits. And then the stuff that we've done before, since we've tested, flown, and fixed it, those are good to go. So... We have awarded a contract to SpaceX. So is anybody here going to go work for SpaceX? Anybody here wants to work for SpaceX? <laughs> really? <laughs> All right. So they are going to build uh, one of their, their one of two contracts to build uh, a lander. So they are going to, it's called HLS, Human Landing System. And this is going to be, uh, this is going to be our first lander. I don't know how accurate this is to scale, but if it is, it's a really big landing system. So we have to figure out it. There's a lot of challenges still we have, still have left for this. But this contract has been awarded, and NASA and SpaceX are working together to build this, uh, build this landing system. Artemis IV is the mission after that. And what we're doing is we have the International Space Station in low Earth orbit. And it's been in low Earth orbit now for about 20 years and built up. We're going to build what we call the Gateway, which is going to be a space station that orbits the moon. So what we'll be able to do is we'll be able to rendezvous up there. It'll be a safe haven. There'll be a place for crew. It'll also be a staging area. So we can have refueling. We can, we can put our uh, crew uh, vehicle, Orion, and our landing system. The crew will transfer into the landing system and, and go down to uh, the surface. So there, again, I won't go through all this stuff, but there's a lot. Every time we do a mission, we introduce new technologies and new capabilities. Artemis 4 again, it's going to have more things for Gateway. I think these are probably duplicate charts, but we'll go through. And then we start really kind of establishing what we're doing on the moon. So Artemis V, we're going to have our unpressurized rover, as, the, as we talked about. Artemis VI, we're going to finish that station around the moon. So when we're not at the moon, we may have astronauts at Gateway doing science and getting ready. Uh, I talked to some people today. This would be a great place. It takes a year to get to Mars and a year to come back. So this would be a great place to get that long-duration experience for one of you guys to be an astronaut and, and live, in, live and work there. And as we keep going, we're going to keep adding concepts. We're going to keep adding, uh, well, we're going to add a habitat. We may add power generation. We've got a lot of things we need to figure out, but there's a lot of things that, that we need to get uh, to first actually have a presence on the lunar surface that's not a week. We pick up some rocks, we come back, we do some great geology, but there's nothing else. So we want to make this sustainable. So humans on the surface, what do we need? We need this human landing system. So instead of NASA building everything now, we're using more partners. So SpaceX and Blue Origin are our two companies that are going to help us with that. Uh, SpaceX, uh, their system is going to be called Starship. 
So they've got contracts for Artemis 3 and 4. And then the Blue Moon system is through Blue Origin. They're still in more of a development system, and they have a, they, they're have they not just one company. They're, they're a team, and you can see part of the folks that are, that are on that team. So we're going to have alternate uh, landing systems and alternate habitats. Gateway, I've, I think I spent a lot of time talking about this, but this is going to be our space station around the moon. Uh, it's, in a, uh, it's in a different orbit, which we'll talk about a little bit. But we, we're going to start off with this power and propulsion element and then uh, uh, what we call HALO, Habitation Logistics Output. So we can put crew up there for 30 days at a time. And as, as we expand, the gateway will expand the amount of time that they can stay up there in space. And it's a, again, it's a safe haven. It's a, it's a docking port. Uh, it's a place that if we need to refuel, we'll be able to do that. So there's a lot of foundational capabilities that we want uh, Gateway to provide. And we're already building hardware for that. The power and propulsion element's in, in construction, and so is, the, so is the Halo. And this kind of, I won't walk through this, but this kind of shows you how, to, how we go from, you know, the beginning of Gateway and, and through the different Artemis things. So by Artemis 7, we'll, we'll have a we'll fully operational space station in orbit around the moon, doing science, providing that safe haven, fuel, refueling, and, and everything else. And this has got a unique orbit. Uh, I, I'm not an orbital mechanics person. I failed that part of college, so uh, <laughs> I don't know how to do all those equations. But it's, it is a it is a it is an interesting orbit because it allows favorable science. Uh, it also provides a favorable communications. You have continuous uh, view of Earth, so you can communicate. And this will also serve as a communications relay for the lunar surface, so our astronauts uh, can have uh, full communication. So there's, there's a lot of, uh, even if we weren't going to the moon, having Gateway would be an amazing capability to do science and, and other things. And we are starting with science. I'm not going to read through these, but these are some of the, uh, the science scientific experiments that, that are scheduled to go on Gateway. These, these are already in development. Uh, there's a lot of stuff here I think would appeal to our physics community. Uh, the simulators, this radiation experiment for physics. So there's a lot of interesting, uh, interesting science that we're going to do on Gateway, regardless of lunar surface operations and the other things. Obviously, we can't use the same suits that we used in the 60s. Uh, they need to be more mobile. We're putting people on the moon for a lot longer. So, we have new suits. They have better communications. They have better. So suits are actually little spacecraft, right? They're they they're, they're support human beings living in space, and so uh, there's a lot of work that goes into this. But you know they're going to be more flexible, easier to maneuver. They can be able to do more science and pick up more things and do more work. They'll the astronauts you know, experience less fatigue. There's a lot of medical science and, and human exercise physiology. A lot of stuff that's going on. So we have two suit builders. We're going to build the next generation of, of, of spacesuits. And again, that's work that's already going on right now. Uh, LTV, I think I've talked about this quite a bit, the lunar terrain vehicle. This is going to be an unpressurized rover. So this is like a dune buggy. But one of the things we have to worry about is surviving the night. So we're going to the south pole of the moon, which is brightly shaded for some portion of the year, and shaded and, uh, and brightly sunlit for some portion of the year. Or if you drive down to a crater, you're never, the sun never shines there. So we have to figure out, you know, we need to survive 100 hours of darkness and, and, and live in a 10-year lifespan. So there's a lot of engineering work that has to be done. It's going to get really cold, and it's going to get really hot. How do you manage that? How do you store the power? How do you do all these other things? So surviving not, not just for the lunar terrain vehicle, but in general, how do we survive that, lunar, that long lunar night? And make sure everything is still working. And these are some future elements we've talked about. Pressurized rover. So this is more like the Winnebago. You can go camping in this thing. So it has life support. It will have you know uh, oxygen, water generation, everything. So you can take, you can go away from the lunar base. Do more science. Uh, dust and radiation detection. I was talking with Dr. Bodowitz in the, uh, in the physics department. Dust is a huge, huge, huge issue. If one of you guys solves that problem, that's what we internally agree. Uh, obviously, we'll be able to reuse it because they're very expensive and it costs a lot of money to get something to the moon. And then you know, we're also going to take this. This is kind of our concept for Mars. We're going to build this pressure on the the first real crew support to go to Mars as of today. And then obviously, surface habitat, we want to have some place to live. It's not just the land. Uh, so, so that requires a lot of other stuff. We want to generate power. We want to build airlock go in and out, control dust, those kinds of things, fix our suits, and we're going to house two crews for up to 30 days. So that requires us to be able to provide support, food, water, oxygen, everything else. So this again is a lot of things. 
How are we going to power them? Uh, solar arrays, maybe. It gets dark for 100 days. What are you going to do then? We were looking at efficient surface power. We're working with different labs across the world to figure out how we're going to solve this problem. And then once we get there, we want to be able to use these resources. Get oxygen. There's water on. There's water ice on the South Pole. How we how, what we can do with that? How we're going to actually build infrastructure? We want to build launch pads, or landing pads. We want to build roads or some paths for our uh, our Winnebago to go down. Uh, blast protect. There's a lot of things that needs to be done. Think the moon has nothing, and we need to build something that, su that supports long-term presence. So this is all the problems that the world needs to solve if we're going to if we're going to make this happen. And then finally, this, so we've got all this stuff, we've got the moon, we've got gateway, none of that stuff gets us to Mars. So then we have to build this transit habitat. Remember, it's a year to get to Mars, a year to come back, plus the time you spend on the surface. So you just, just think about that, it's 1,100 days worth of transit, life support, food, power, going into deep, deep space. So how are we going to do that? We don't know yet. We're working on trying to figure this out. We're learning lessons from space station. We're going to learn lessons from our, our lunar stays. We're going to learn lessons from gateway, build fly tests, put all that together. But this is a key enabling element. If we can't send somebody to Mars, we obviously can't work there. And I talked about this a little bit, but this is a global community. It's the United States, we don't, not only we may have the capability to do it alone, but we shouldn't. This should be something that we involve the whole world in and, and, and get contributions and good ideas from everybody in the world. The space program has become internationalized over the last 20 years, and it needs to continue that way. So we are, we've got uh, a series, uh, NASA has a series of things called Artemis Accords, and so they're just a set of principles that different countries have signed up to, to uh, how we're going to be, we're going to work together, things are going to be interoperable, we're going to talk about safety and how we let other people know we're in the area. There's a lot of things there. And then obviously, we've got scientific collaborations. The science world has been international forever. But this makes sure that when we go to Gateway and we go to the moon, that we, we keep those collaborations going. And then for specific things, we sign memora memoranda of under understanding, which, you know, that's just a legal term. So this was about six months ago. You could probably double the number of countries on this, uh, on this chart. But these are all the different countries that have signed up to the Artemis Accords and hopefully are going to participate in the, uh, in the mission. So I'm going to swap over here because we had a little bit of... Uh, computer issues, Let's see if we can make this work. He has ever embarked on before. And we will discover life-saving, earth-changing science and technology along the way. We're delving deep into what science can be achieved by humans working together with robotic capabilities and future infrastructure to support a long-term human presence at the moon. The Artemis generation stands ready, ready to return humanity to the moon and then to take us further than ever before to Mars. Onward and upward. So I think that's, that's my presentation. Hopefully you guys learned something. I know I didn't discuss any deep physics or cosmology, but I hope I got you excited about how we want to go to the moon and back to, uh, back to the moon and to Mars. Uh, and I, you know, I think we've got some time for questions, Alan, I'm not sure. So I actually talked a little bit faster than I thought I would. That's I always great. Do, but. Um, yeah, we've got time for just a few questions. Yeah, let's give them a round of applause. Yes, sir. Nick. Nick. Um, what's the timeline for these different steps in the Artemis program? So Artemis 2 should be 2025, and it looks like <coughs> so we're developing and trying to plan missions at the same time. So, you know, you don't know what you don't know. But I think we're probably, I think the last NASA was looking at, just one quick disclaimer. I don't work for NASA anymore, so this is not official NASA <laughs> policy. But we were looking at about approximately three-year centers for those things. So it may be more, maybe less. Part of it depends on how fast we can produce some of this hardware. Yes, sir. Um, you heard so much about um, lava tubes and caves and um, using those to escape radiation and all that. Right. Is that something for the far 
future, or is that something realistic? Uh, there has been some research on that. I am probably the wrong person to ask about that. But I know that they've looked into that, and there, there are some of those surface features. They are spending uh, a lot of effort. A lot of these precursor missions, robotic missions, are going to be to do really detailed surface mapping. And so maybe that will, and then they'll have to figure out. Right now, we're, we're limited by, is we, land the, we land on, it's funny, we land on a certain spot. Our communications infrastructure, as it stands today, would not, won't let the astronauts go more than two to three kilometers away from the landing, landing zone. So we're actually trying to build, uh, NASA's trying to build uh, basically a GPS for the, for the lunar surface. And so that will first, first, you know, obviously the lander and the habitats will have that radiation shielding. But as they go farther, we have to figure that out. That's a good question. Yes, sir. Right, so eventually it's going to be more than that. So the, the first initial missions would be two surface, two, uh, two probably would stay at, I'm not sure exactly, because I haven't have to go back through and, and understand what would they, but two on the surface and two in lunar orbit, and, or maybe two on the surface, one a gateway, one in lunar orbit, those kinds of things. As they, as they get the cadence faster, as if we, get two, if we can get two landers almost simultaneously or figure out how to re- uh, Actually, the landers are going to go up and down, but once we get a habitat, we'll pro the habitat is not for two. The habitat will be larger than two. The landers will be a two-person lander at this point. If we can figure out how to get two of them down there pretty close to each other, then maybe we can double the size of that. Sure. Ellie had her hand up. Probably. So I, I'm not going to get into politics here. <laughs> <laughs> so there's an astronaut core, and they we train astronauts from all different nations and they're part they technically belong to their space agency so there is a process to negotiate who flies on what there's also a list of year that there's basically everyone's got a turn and that's that's whose turn has come up for lack of a better explanation there is also politics involved in that and a bunch of other things that I have n had nothing to do with I didn't I never worked in the crew office so I'm not going to go down the road of put but it's really, when's your turn? You got to go through all the training. They're in training now, and, and we'll go from there. So, uh, since, I, since I get to do this, I'm going to sneak in a question of my own. I mean, just this <coughs> idea of going to the moon and going to the Mars, sending humans, you've outlined, and I think most folks in this audience know, that's really, really hard. But it's also really exciting. I mean, I think about it like, holy, yeah. th that's a place we haven't been. <laughs> but I, when I talk to other colleagues, colleagues, friends, whatever, they often say, why are we even doing that? Can't we do it all with robots? So I would like some fuel for my fire, <laughs> and I hope you can help me with that. Well, there's a couple of things. One, obviously, you do, you'll develop more technologies that are useful on Earth to support human life. There's okay. a lot of stuff. All this remote patient monitoring that you're used to, you go to the hospital now, that all came out of the space program in the 60s. Dang. Dang. <laughs> Cordless tools, all this. So I can give you a long list, and we put, we put a. But humans have brains, robots have computers, and I don't know where the AI world is going. Okay, so you guys are probably researching that more than I. But it's that judgment, that human judgment, that that thought process, that working together, and then there's the whole inspiration part. It's really cool. You, you not it's it's not really, and the the Mars rovers are incredibly exciting. But imagine putting somebody there. How exciting. How much excitement? I don't think that excitement changed because we're in the 2000s now as opposed to in the 60s, right? So there's a lot of that. And it, it also broadens that international cooperation. You know, we'll have, for, we'll have astronauts from other countries. We'll have this whole community. You can't do that. And there are people that eventually that want to say, okay, we actually need to colonize space. Well, the only way you can do it is with people. Right. So. Fair. Maybe a couple more quick questions. But Beth did his hand up right here. Uh, Dust gets everywhere. Dust, uh, people can, the dust is, is, is a health hazard. Uh, it also messes up machinery. It's, it, it has been a very hard problem to solve that we still haven't technically solved yet. So there have been, we have tried a lot, and that is one, if you look at NASA's rack and stack of things that they need to solve, surface power, posi uh, position navigation and timing, and dust mitigation are in the top five. 
because of the because of the hazard and the need to control it. Right now, they're you know, and if we can do it somehow where we don't need to have an airlock where they don the suits and take the suits off and all this other work, that'll every pound that we don't have for infra every kilo we don't use for infrastructure is is a kilo we use for science or a kilo we use for life support. So that that weight, anything we can make to make it simpler. And dust mitigation right now is a very complex problem. Will will help us. Last question. Do you have any numbers on this? Like, uh, what kind of weather data uh, are you using? I do not, but I'm sure somebody does. <laughs> <laughs> I can. We can. Uh, so the people, just if you're ever on uh, messing around with NASA, it's this Space Technology Mission Director. They're there. They have the 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 remit to uh, figure out how to mitigate the dust. All right, let's thank Dr. Doris Lomi one more time.